Welcome to From Pages to Practice, the podcast that highlights new research and columns in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Josh Bereson and the podcast editor for the journal. I'm usually joined by Lisa Dixon, but she's out for this week, so I am instead joined today by a special guest, Dr. Lloyd Sederer, who is the Chief Medical Officer of the New York State Office of Mental Health and Adjunct Professor at the Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. Lloyd, did I get your title right? Yes, and I'm delighted and honored to be a guest on your program. We are delighted to have you. Um, we've got a good show today. We're going to look at what I guess is some uh, some good news and bad news about psychiatric workforce issues. We're going to look at depression prevention in high schools, and then we're also going to discuss implicit bias in mental health. First up, we've got Anand Satyani, Julie Niedermeyer, Bhagwan Satyani, and Dale Svensson's article on projected workforce of psychiatrists in the United States, a population analysis. I wanted to focus on this article because this issue seems to come up on an almost daily basis uh, when you work in a public mental health system. And it, it just seems like it's kind of at the root of all of these challenges that come up. Um, and, and all roads sort of seem to lead to workforce issues. So this is probably something that you've been thinking about for quite a while in your career. Throughout my career, I'm afraid to say, even more so today than ever. And just, you know, generally, how have you um, kind of thought about this issue? Well, the article points out the circumstances around psychiatric workforce are bad and that they're going to get worse. And maybe they'll get better eight, ten, or more years from now, but we don't know, and that's an awfully long horizon to uh, stare at. There used to be a trope uh, that you can't find a psychiatrist in August because they're all on vacation, and actually today, now the trope needs to be you can't find a psychiatrist any month of the year, in public mental health in particular in part because there are too few of us. And there are also many who are working part-time and also looking ahead. Over half of the psychiatric workforce are gray hairs like me. They're over 55. So how long will we stay? How many hours will we work? And uh, there are fewer people entering the field, fewer docs entering the practice of psychiatry than those leaving. That's not a good balance. So we're looking at losing uh, capacity in the upcoming years. Yeah, and it really seems like this, um, it creates like a bottleneck for a lot of the services within the public mental health sector. So like if you're talking to uh, intake to a clinic or for evaluations for various programs that need a psychiatric evaluation, just just to get in the front door, this workforce issue really creates um, uh, um, kind of a, a, a block uh, just to get in the front door for services. And, and that's really where I've seen these workforce issues take um, center stage, that people, programs don't have enough psychiatrists to, to keep up with the demand. I think you're making an essential point here, Josh, and that has to do with team care, particularly for people with serious mental illness and in the public sector. uh, The care is delivered by a team, but there's got to be a psychiatrist on the team for various reasons, medical reasons, prescribing reasons, consultation, and the presence of a doctor makes a difference. And uh, uh, that's part of the also delays because uh, an appointment's because it's very hard to get time with the psychiatrist. Right. So basically everyone knows that this is an issue, but we don't really have a recent analysis about the shortage and how it's actually going to evolve in the future. So the problem is pretty simple. Um, On the psychiatrist side, there are lots of psychiatrists who are, um, as you refer to them, gray hairs. They're getting ready to retire. And there's not that many people coming into the workforce. So I guess these would be... um, uh, like what what would we call them newly newly minted psychiatrists? That's a good term. Yeah, so we don't have enough people kind of refilling the population at the same rate that it's uh, leaving the workforce. Plus, the U.S. population is growing. We know that we have a high rate of mel- mental illness in the United States. So the point of this paper is to put some numbers to all of those different variables. So they use data from the Association of Medical Colleges the American... The Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, right? That's right, and U.S. Census data. As you said, the gist is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. So that inflection point is actually in 2024. And around 2024, the shortage of psychiatrists is going to be somewhere between 14,000 and 31,000 psychiatrists. So by 2050, we're in um, a little bit of better shape. 
<laughs> 2050, that's a few years away. Uh, I'm not sure where we'll be from climate change in 2050. <laughs> but even this inflection point, uh, uh, six, eight years from now, uh, that's a long time away. And we've got problems right now. Well, I mean, one way to put this in context is that it's going to be uh, 2039 before they project that we get back to where we are right now. So that's a, that's kind of a sobering statistic. Indeed it is. And the shortage is not just in numbers, because it's also in distribution. Where are the doctors who are available? What kind of access does the general public have to them? This is very different in rural upstate New York or rural Ohio than it is in New York City. And then in even New York City, you can't get an appointment unless you're willing to pay privately. So many of our colleagues don't take insurance. Uh, Right. And there's this amazing statistic that they they cite that I've seen before that 96% of U.S. counties have an unmet need uh, for prescribers. So that's that's like a big chunk of the country. And I guess the question now is, what are we going to do about this, right? This thing's going to get worse. um, And even when it gets better, that's not for for quite a while at this point. So what can we really do in the next few years? One way to think about this is supply and demand. On the supply side, that means how we can deliver more care with the existing workforce of psychiatrists that we now have. And team care is instrumental to being able to deliver care to more people. It's not retail where the doctor is the only one caring for the patient, but a team is. And that this is instrumental to community mental health, uh, where there is a group of people serving somebody in need, including peers. But a team relies on a psychiatrist, but a psychiatrist can carry a far larger caseload because of team care. That's one supply solution. I think another interesting question here is that we sort of take this prevalence, this high prevalence of mental illness in the country as a given. So I think it's also important to think through uh, about prevention and how we might be able to make more of a dent in the, um, the demand side as well. Indeed. And in thinking about the demand side, it's important to remember that only 10% of our health and mental health is determined by medical care. 90% has to do with what has come to be called the social determinants of health, principally our behaviors. This is where prevention and about self-care and about improving somebody's course of illness by their being able to take better care of themselves, be able more to control their behaviors, how they sleep, whom they socialize with, what kind of stability they have in their housing, how can they lessen their use of substances, how can they improve uh, their own uh, levels of anxiety. Society. These are social determinants of health, and when people take better care of themselves, they need less time with the doctors. This is one. This is one important demand approach that we've got to think about uh, because uh, not only is it uh, put less strain on a already limited workforce, it actually is about people taking better care of themselves. Yeah, and uh, as I sort of said, as we introduced the the paper, this is what's one thing that's so interesting about uh, workforce, that you can start talking about what might seem kind of like a dry statistical issue, but you can get into access, you can get into social determinants of health. It really uh, does bring up a wide variety of of topics, and we need to keep this uh, uh, front and center. Next up, we have Sagar Parikh, John Greedman, and colleagues on the Michigan Peer-to-Peer Depression Awareness Program, School-Based Prevention to Address Depression Among Teens. So I, I really like this article for um, a number of reasons. One is that, again, it just touches on so many like, really important topics like uh, primary prevention, um, stigma, peer interventions. Uh, this, this article really has a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of good stuff in there. And uh, just to dive right in, um, the model that they're using um, for what they're doing here is looking at high schools that have identified champions for mental health. And these champions attend 
six hour long trainings that uh, are really designed to teach them how to do things like public awareness campaigns, um, which they can then bring back to schools to implement. So we're talking about things like um, assemblies, posters, promotional billboards, giveaways, that sort of thing. And what the study did is they did a pre and post survey of 49 of the champions but they also looked at 830 or so of the students within the school who received the interventions. So lots and lots of results here in the paper, but before we get to those, um, you, you said earlier that you really just loved this study. I did. I love this work. and another t- It's another important testimonial to the great work that comes out of the University of Michigan Department of Psychiatry. And it's also evidence of what is a deep principle in community mental mental health, which is you, you go to where the people are, the people that you want to serve. And in this case, it's the kids. Well, either they're asleep on the phone texting or they're in school and they met them in school. Right. You've just gone through pretty much the entire uh, uh, life cycle of, of an adolescent. <laughs> so I should watch what I say, but the point is that kids spend the predominant of their waking time, at least during the week in school. So in order to reach kids, we've got to go where they are. And in this intervention, they went to 10 high schools. Right. So two of the results that jumped out of me from the pre and post surveys were uh, that in the general population, so these are people who kind of received the intervention, not the ones who were involved in putting them on. In the people who received the intervention, those students had an increased knowledge of depression symptoms and also had a decreased scores on a number of measures of stigma. Those are the two big things that, that popped out for me. Was there anything that jumped out for you? If I might, I would just want to linger another moment about the method that they use because this intervention was both designed and implemented by the youth. So this is what's called user design, user friendly design, where actually in this instance, the young people were the ones who built it and therefore had so much more of a stake in in using it and making it successful. Uh, That's a really smart way to approach an intervention. Right. And that applies not just in high school, but to all the interventions that that we designed, um, whether they're program improvement, quality improvement, that if they're coming sort of from on high and not from people who are really involved in either the day-to-day work or who are going to be receiving the intervention or who have to give the intervention, it doesn't resonate and it's not true to life. And, And that's kind of baked into this study. Indeed. And all the, uh, peer advocates all were they were all volunteers these are the youth that you've called the champions and they stepped forward and they said i want to take the training and i want to help and there was a halo effect because these were the students then who exposed other students in variety of ways so that it wasn't just the 121 champions it was well over 800 students who were touched by the intervention Right. And, you know, one of the other things that they found was that there was a relatively high rate of people who were exposed to the intervention who followed up with additional activities. So these weren't people or or these kids weren't sort of just dragged to uh, the the daily assembly and had to sit through some uh, some presentation. They actually found some meaning in it enough to um, to follow up, which also really speaks to how engaging the interventions must have been, but also for the real need within um, within that uh, that population. Yes, this is about changing the culture in a school and using a portion of the students to do that uh, and then enabling that to propagate throughout a much larger group of students. And some people might call this universal prevention in that it wasn't just about identifying kids at risk, it was about supplying preventative techniques for all the students involved. Uh, Right. And uh, um, a couple of episodes ago, Lisa and I talked about a a paper on mental health first aid, which seems a little bit similar in its approach in that it's this kind of ever expanding reach of an effect. It's not just the high school students within the high school 
who changed or thought differently about mental illness. But kids are probably going home to their families, going to do other activities. And it seems like there's a real um, potential for spillover effects that could hopefully change even a broader culture than just the high school. Absolutely. And these young people are being taught and provided skills. Often, uh, whether they're uh, we're adults or youth, we don't do something because we don't know what to do or we don't know what to say or we're concerned about how we'll say it. But if somebody gives us skills, like with mental health first aid or about this youth intervention, we then have something uh, that uh, is, uh, we're, we're trained, uh, we're programmed, uh, if you will, to know what to do at the moment, so we're much more apt to act. Right, and then there's also kind of a, um, uh, like a train, train the trainer component, where they can then also tell other people um, how to do the same things. Right. Important to state that these students did not do any counseling themselves. They were what were called peer advocates, but they were instrumental to the culture change. They weren't pretending to be therapists. Right. And they don't, uh, you know, they're not supposed to be therapists. That's not, not the point. And we talked about the workforce issue in the last segment and talked a little bit about this primary prevention approach. But it's also uh, another non-traditional approach to services. You know, like you said, they're not providing direct services. They're not providing counseling. But they are providing something that, if it's not akin to it, they're, they're at least creating a culture that would be somewhat similar to mental health first aid, which should, at some point, decrease the burden on professionals who are providing the services. And this relates to the next article as well, because it's about how people can be more willing to talk and and to enable access uh, for those people who need help. Suddenly there is somebody saying that there is help to somebody in distress because they know that there is, that there's a way to get help, and let me help you get it. Access has always been one of the biggest problems accompanying stigma in terms of people getting the care that they need. Last up, we have Yesenia Marino, Leslie Adams, and William Hall's open forum on implicit bias and mental health professionals, priorities and directions for future research. So uh, another really important article that should give people pause and um, hopefully um, uh, make people reflect a little bit about their practice and mental health practice in general. But uh, just to set the stage, they're defining implicit bias as a subtle form of discriminatory action that is often outside of an individual's conscious awareness. So the paper gives a couple really good examples of of this. Did any of those pop out for you or any examples that you Indeed, one example of implicit bias where we misunderstand the behavior of somebody is imagine you're a black youth walking down a white uh, neighborhood street like in the film Get Out and you're afraid because you have reason to be because you're going to be seen as an invader or something worse. That was the story in Get Out. But yet... uh, Uh, If you are paranoid there, you have good reason to be because you're experiencing an abnormal uh, situation, not an abnormal symptom in those moments. But what can happen is that that vigilance can be misdiagnosed or interpreted to be some type of paranoia, some type of schizophrenia, because their behaviors raise questions that touch on implicit bias. Yeah, so the example that you give is from from the paper, and it, it's really an example of the provider looking at a person through a very specific lens, or, or I guess being blind to some of the other psychosocial issues that are surrounding their, um, their description of their inner life. And in this case, they're doing it based on somebody's skin color. Rather than taking a step back and thinking through all the different reasons that this could be the case, people rely on these these biases and, and come up with them as uh, symptoms rather than a, a natural reaction to an abnormal situation. Indeed. Another example of implicit bias, ironically, which may have turned out to be protective, is with the opioid epidemic. More white people have been uh, taken up, lost in the disease, uh, the epidemic, 
because it's a consequence of their having been more freely prescribed opioids by doctors and the implicit bias that existed in many medical practices that uh, doctors didn't want to give opioids to black people because they thought they were going to get hooked. And so black people had less access and they have then had less problem with the progression from uh, pills uh, and even on to heroin. So this is another example of implicit bias, which may uh, ironically be protective. And I think the the implicit part is um, really important here. You know, I don't think that people are going to work and saying, you know, I'm only going to give um, opioids to white people in my practice <laughs> today. You know, these are things that are really unconscious and that only come to light when you take a step back and, in that case, kind of look at larger uh, prescribing patterns. So they're hard to see, um, which makes it a problem that's uh, hard to tackle. And even when you know about it, like I think that this open forum is really helping to raise consciousness about the issue, taking something that's unconscious and making it, it, it conscious. But people will have to look at some really potentially thorny and uh, difficult uh, aspects of their, their unconscious life and their, their practice as psychiatrists. Yes and no, because it is very hard, uh, short of psychoanalysis, uh, <laughs> to bring the unconscious into awareness. Yes, just but, for our listeners, um, neither of us are on a couch right now. Right, that's right, though I have been in the past. That, um, what, I bring this up because um, what does work in terms of uh, changing people's views, attitudes uh, about reducing stigma uh, are two things. One is when individual clinicians, other people, are exposed to somebody, meet somebody, talk with somebody face-to-face who has a particular condition, whether it's schizophrenia or dependence on heroin, they discover that there's a human being there and that that's a way to change bias without even psychoanalysis. The second way of changing implicit bias is with stories of improvement where people get better, hopeful stories, positive stories change implicit bias because we're, uh, we discover that somebody can actually do well and that we can be a part of their getting better. Yeah, and we, um, you know, that reminds me of another article that Lisa and I highlighted a, a couple episodes ago about um, how to change um, uh, policy, how to make policy improvements. Um, and uh, the what you're talking about in terms of uh, telling stories is uh, was one of the things that was highlighted in, in, in that article. With this article, one of the things that um, I really like is that they're not just uh, talking about implicit bias, they're also talking about some of the systemic implications of this. They talk about criminal justice, but they also talk about access to services. And they point out that in psychiatry, it's a little unique because the gatekeeper is often a an individual person. And so that person's biases really end up affecting people's access to the greater system as a whole. Yes, there is somebody at the gate, and whether that person opens the door or makes the door difficult to go through makes a big difference. Once someone's through the door and they're involved with team care, this problem may be smoothed out by the presence of others, but there is a gatekeeper, and that's a big that's a big that can be a big barrier yeah and you know i also think one of the interesting things about um, this issue is that a lot of the providers that work in the public mental health system are choosing to work with people who have histories of incarceration or substance use or homelessness so it's really interesting to kind of think through how even if you're going to work with all the best of intentions you can still develop or hold on to things that kind of color the way that you see your, your, your patients and your clients. And in the public mental health system, we work with people who will stir implicit bias, somebody who may be just right out of Rikers or may be out of an upstate prison or out of a shelter. So, yeah, we need to uh, meet these people. We need to uh, understand that they're people, they're not just diseases, and we need to understand that they or recognize that they can get better too. And we also have to recognize that everybody has um, some implicit biases 
to me, it doesn't seem like uh, an accusation. Um, it's something that's universal, and um, the important thing is to recognize it so that it's not affecting the, the care of your patients. And expose ourselves to people uh, whom we uh, might have implicit bias with. We invite you to visit our website, ps.psychiatryonline.org, to read the articles we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research. We also welcome your feedback. Please email us at psjournal at psych.org. Org. Lloyd, thank you very much. How'd it go? It's been great to be here, and it's a great service you're providing. Thanks so much for including me. Well, uh, this was great. We really appreciate you, uh, you joining us, and we'll be back uh, next time back with uh, Lisa Dixon. Thanks again. <laughs>